All right, so welcome everyone to Midbus seventh webinar of the year. Today, we have Farah Jafar, Chief Executive Officer of Labuan IBFC Incorporated, a wholly owned subsidiary of Labuan Financial Services Authority, the, sta the statutory regulatory authority for Labuan International Business and Financial Center, operating under the purview of the Ministry of Finance Malaysia. Labuan IBSC Incorporated serve as the Jurisdiction Official Market Development Agency. Without further ado, let's welcome Farah Jaffa to share with us insights on Labuan IBSC and its role as a regional wholesale financial and risk intermediation hub. She also will be sharing the latest development and opportunities in the reinsurance risk intermediation ecosystem of Labuan IBSC. Good morning, everyone. Foremost, once again, thank you very much. Thank you, Sazali. Ali. Okay. This is a, is a rare opportunity uh, for us to actually brief the Broking Association in Malaysia. And uh, I have to say that when uh, Roy Sharma, who is the chairman of the Labuan International Association, Insurance Association suggested that, that we do this and hooked us, out, uh, hooked us up with Vicky and the team at MIPA, um, it, it, it occurred to me very quickly that uh, it was a shame that we, sh we should have really done this earlier. So apologies for not uh, reaching out any earlier, first and foremost, and thank you so much for taking the time. Um, let me just give a little bit of background about Labon IBFC Incorporated. So, you know, as Cash uh, mentioned earlier, Labon IBFC Incorporated is a wholly owned subsidiary of uh, Labon Financial Services Authority. And our role really, we're non-commercial, and our role really is just to uh, ensure that there's enough information out there uh, about Lab One IBFC and for us to act as really an app between the regulator out to the market and the market back to the regulator vis-a-vis uh, -vis developments in Lab One, uh, updates about Lab One, suggestions and, and, and considerations that the regulator should look at in developing the ecosystem uh, holistically. Yeah, uh, We are manned by a team of about 15 uh, market professionals and I have the honor of uh, running the, the organization for the last almost five years now and it's been absolutely amazing I have to say absolutely amazing to uh, enjoy and be part of the growth of Lab One. So the, the complete ecosystem of Lab One is quite extensive right so we run everything from banks insurance wealth management structures uh, that whole range and actually to be honest with you as of end of last year we're home to more than 800 license holders uh, spanning this range of which uh, 220 are insurance holders. So let me go into the, the presentation. Yeah. Um, so the first slide really talks about uh, La Buena IBFC. We've been around uh, for more than 30 years now. Uh, two or three years ago, we celebrated our 30th anniversary. Started in 1990. And um, really the, the objective of La Buena is as an intermediation and financial center. Uh, it, it does create an opportunity. Uh, it does create an opportunity for everyone to enjoy the benefits of Lab One. Uh, you know, not just um, as part of a regional uh, financial ecosystem, but specifically for Malaysians. And you know, as I make this presentation time and time again, uh, what strikes me is not necessarily uh, the, all the stats and all the information here, but a lot of the question revolves around why would a country like Malaysia have a jurisdiction like Labuan and BFC? Right? I mean, it's a logical question because in a lot of instances, first and foremost, we're mixed up as an offshore center, which really we are not. Um, but why would Malaysia, and I think you have to go back 30 years, more than 30 years in the planning of Malaysia and how Malaysia has grown uh, since then. I think 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, a lot of Malaysian corporates were looking, going outside Malaysia as part of their business plan. And towards that, the government decided that maybe setting up an intermediation center would be an ideal uh, environment in order to ensure that there is a little bit of a, a safe harbor, as it were. And it's interesting to note uh, and it's interesting to note that uh, Labuan itself, the name of Labuan, uh, as you might have been able to read at the video earlier, uh, stems from the word port per Labuhan, right? So really, we are a wholesale intermediation center that is tax efficient. It's substance enabling. So I'm sure a lot of you understand that there are changes with, with regards to the global tax landscape. And uh, that has required that substance be able to be curated uh, within the jurisdiction that you use. So we facilitate business, trading, investments, 
and we have a wide array of legal structures. So these are corporate structures like companies, uh, partnerships, uh, and, and uh, solutions as, such as those. Um, well-balanced, we like to think we have a well-balanced legal and regulatory framework. We have a proportionality in our regulatory stance. And that is something that's quite interesting to note because we don't, uh, we are not a domestic financial system, first and foremost. We're a wholesale financial system. So only qualified investors and corporates are able to, to use Labuan. In that sense, we create a very bespoke uh, financial environment from which these entities are able to to, to operate within. And that is a key element of all international financial centers is that we're able to sit down at the table and understand the business a bit better, allow for certain flexibilities, allow for, uh, for a level of um, cooperation with the business as it were, yeah? Um, so robust governing legislations passed by the Malaysian parliament administered by the Laban FSA, which as mentioned earlier, is a statutory body at the Ministry of Finance. Now, the other thing that a lot of people question is that how do you plug the hole? And I use that word very candidly, and I'm a very candid person. Those of you who know me will, will know that for sure. Uh, how do you plug the hole, as it were, between the Malaysian tax, the Labuan tax, the Malaysian uh, AMLA requirements and the Labuan AMLA requirements? Well, the answer is actually very simple, and the government has been very wise in how they've uh, decided to, to structure this solution. Uh, number one, all AMLA requirements, all anti-money laundering requirements and international standards by global multilateral organizations that Malaysia adheres to, Labuan adheres to too. So there's no arbitrage. This is, there's no arbitrage at all, actually, uh, with regards to that angle between Labuan offshore or midshore and Malaysia onshore, right? That's one. Tax. There's no uh, uh, arbitrage with regards to tax in Lab One, and that's very simple because there are actually two competent authorities that manage Lab One. Lab One FSA that manages everything but the taxation system, and the Malaysian Income Tax Board that manages only the income tax regime within Lab One. So, as you can see, we are in a very middle ground environment, and uh, maybe that's why we are called uh, Mitchell. Yeah. Um, so this is moving now to the second slide, right? So what is the risk management, the insurance and the risk management landscape in Labuan? And I think uh, a lot of people uh, try to understand how this sits within the domestic system, right? So we offer an extremely, I mean, in my mind, based on my understanding of other regional jurisdictions and other international financial centers, we offer a very wide range of structures uh, and licenses, right? So everything from a full-fledged insurance uh, license, reinsurance, broking, um, and obviously as of late, we have been very, uh, we have been more and more recognized as a self-insurance jurisdiction. Um, and really these structures are available in both conventional and Sharia compliant versions, right? So we like to think that because Labuan has an omnibus uh, Islamic legislation Actually, we, we know that Labuan has an omnibus le Islamic legislation. And from that legislation stems the fact that everything that you can do conventionally within Labuan, you're able to do uh, in a takaful and Sharia compliant version, right? So for, for all intents and purposes, uh, a takaful broker, a takaful reinsurer, a takaful, insur a takaful insurer, or that's a double negative, I guess, a takaful player. Uh, provide, uh, we provide a complete risk management ecosystem, as I mentioned, more than 220. I think the following slides will explain to you that now we are up to almost uh, 230 license holders in Lab One. And what's important to note is that, you know, unlike a lot of other jurisdictions, we are not a one trick pony, right? So we have an entire ecosystem. Uh, that sits within the Labuan financial system. So we're not necessarily just known for our insurance solutions. And this is where there's a lot of synergy to be had uh, in Labuan. So, you know, we have 200, more than 220 license holders. We have about 60 banks, right? Um, we have 65 trust and corporate service providers. Um, we have 300, 400 leasing companies. They, you know, they all create an ecosystem and this ecosystem provides a very stable environment from which uh, specific verticals can grow. 
right? Because what you do need is an entire ecosystem in order to support the business that goes through Labuan, right? And, and that's a very key element of why Labuan is, is getting more and more recognition is because we are an entire ecosystem. It is not just, oh, this is a jurisdiction A and they are known for, for this particular uh, industry, right? So numerous uh, underwriting insurance managers high level of advisory management services within Labuan uh, and the advisory vis-a-vis -vis Labuan is available obviously within Labuan, within Kuala Lumpur, Hong Kong, Singapore. Um, I think the Labuan structures are quite well known regionally. Yeah. Um, and of course, we're the only uh, Asian jurisdiction with a protected cell company uh, for insurance. Right. Um, and over the last three, four years, I think we've really been recognized as Asia's fastest growing self-insurance market. Um, and before I, I talk a bit more, you know, I always like to say that it's interesting to note that when you look at the insurance and risk management business within Lab One, it has grown organically. And the reason I say that is because, as we all know, uh, Lab One was set up with the idea of being first right of refusal for Malaysian business. And through that, what has happened is that from that strong base of being a first right of refusal and all of all that Malaysian business, ex-Malaysia business going through Labuan. Labuan is now really growing its momentum and is now predominantly no longer Malaysian. So it's been a very organic growth. Uh, don't forget we've been around 30 years. So, you know, through those years, we have been able to create a very strong structure as we develop again, recreate that strong base and develop again, right? So insurance within Labuan, I think I've mentioned direct insurance, reinsurance, broking, captive, underwriting. Um, it's interesting and important to note that Labuan Insurer may carry on the reinsurance of Malaysian insurance business, including the making and receiving of payments in Malaysian ringgit, right? And as I mentioned, Labuan reinsurers are accorded the first right of refusal for Malaysian risks uh, prior to seeding outside Malaysia. Um, let me go now to really discussing um, the growth over the last five years. And, you know, it's it's interesting. I mean, I started in Labuan as communications director in oh no, uh, 2008, uh, 2008, when the Labuan FSA first set up this uh, unit. Uh, I came from the stock exchange. And before that, I myself was a broker, but not an insurance broker, a stock broker and a derivatives broker. Um, so it, it, it was very interesting to get to understand Lab One. Um, and I under I can appreciate, I should say, how the domestic financial system doesn't necessarily understand Lab One as well as it should, uh, because there are definitely synergies to be had. Um, the Lab One, let's go back to the Lab One insurance industry specifically. And I think this is this is a, a snapshot of how we've grown over the last five years, right? Um, what's important to note is now we're home to more than 200 on the on the right hand side here, you can see. So the numbers here are not new until you get to point number four. Point number four is actually a new number. So in the first half of 2021, we have approved 10 new licenses, right? And this is off the back of uh, another similar number for the whole of 2020. So really the insurance uh, industry in Lab One is growing leap and leaps and bounds, even within the pandemic. Uh, and, and this is uh, where, you know, and everyone knows this has slowed everything down quite significantly. So it's really quite interesting and very heartening to know the growth that Lab One is enjoying and continues to enjoy, uh, even as we go into 2021 with the full brunt of the, pen the effects of the pandemic, I feel. Um, so as of the first half of 2021, the numbers are 228 license holders. Uh, the gross uh, written premium in the first quarter of 2021 actually grew by 12.6%, right? So this is the first quarter uh, growth in premiums grew double digits, more than 12% in the first quarter of 2021. So the Lab 1 in insurance industry, so these are the numbers that you can see. Um, so these are the numbers uh, for the first half. For the first half, so the first half, just to recap, the first half of 2021, we've approved 10 new license approvals, right? So now the, now the total number of license holders stand at 228. 
Um, the gross premiums for the first quarter recorded a growth of more than 12%. Uh, percent. Uh, this is for the first quarter 2021. And the reinsurance uh, sector continues to dominate market with, with more than more than 50% focusing on underwriting, fire, marine, and motor risk. What's interesting to note is I think a lot of the domestic players seem to think that Labuan just focuses on Malaysian risk that can't be fulfilled domestically and is looking to go out. The truth couldn't be further from that. Because as you can see here, right, more than 60% is now foreign business. So Malaysia is not is no longer the key market. You know, of course, it's a it's a significant, it's a very significant market, but not necessarily any more key market uh, for the Labuan insurance uh, industry. And this really uh, hints to the fact that we are uh, really being now recognised as this uh, regional uh, risk intermediation hub. I think that's an important element to take away from this. Um, next is uh, the slide that uh, the describes growth opportunities. So, you know, as a Malaysian broker, how can you benefit from Labuan? You know, and I think uh, sometimes the, the consideration is that, yeah, if it's going to Labuan, um, you know, there's, there's no uh, skin in the game for me anymore. And so what difference does it make? Well, actually, to be honest with you, it, it can't be further than the truth, because as the Labuan reinsurance industry grows, and as the loved one broking industry grows, there is more and more an opportunity for collaboration uh, between the loved one broking industry and the domestic broking industry. You know, and I think uh, that's that's something I'm very passionate about about partnerships. Uh, I'm very passionate about making sure that the pie becomes big enough for everyone and everyone grows collectively because that's the only way to grow. I really believe that you know loved ones at the at the stage of its growth where the Malaysian uh, broking industry can definitely benefit from being part of the Labuan ecosystem in one way, shape or form. And I think w one of the main reasons we really were very keen to do this event is to obviously explain Labuan a bit better, but also highlight the opportunities for co-reinsurance broking between Malaysian brokers and Labuan brokers, right? So I think this, this is just a very simple uh, chart here to show everyone the possibility here where you have a, a Malaysian risk owner going to a Malaysian insurer via a Malaysian broker. And then from there, the ability to use a Labuan reinsurer and to benefit from a core reinsurance broking uh, element, right? All the way out into retro and from retro, possibly all the way back in again. Right, so it's not necessarily just one-sided. It's also two-sided. Coming, you know, being able to do that, because you know, as an ex-broker, I understand that in broking, what is key is relationships, um, relationships with the risk owner, relationships with the insurers. Yes, domestically, but you know, I guess I'm here to say, also explore pos possible relationships and partnerships that you may be able to cultivate with a Labran broker, with a Labran insurer as well. Right. But obviously, forever being mindful of uh, bank Nagara requirements that Malaysian risk must be insured by a Nagara licensed insurer unless approved by BNM. And I think uh, with regards to this, um, there's only the MET requirements that, that are now allowed, you know, MET, uh, yeah, the, M the MET policies that are now allowed, okay? Uh, and Labuan insurer may underwrite reinsurance of Malaysian insurance business, including transacting in Malaysian ringgit. You know, I'm happy to talk about this. Um, later at our panel, which I'm keen to get to. So the next slide it really discusses um, why Labuan. So why Labuan IBFC? Uh, my question to you is why not really, right? So if you are going to look at uh, uh, outside Malaysia, at a jurisdiction outside Malaysia, if your needs or your client needs uh, demand this kind of a solution, why not Labuan IBFC? Why not closer to home, right? Um, we provide a robust, well-regulated mutual jurisdiction. We're white listed by the EU, uh, classified as non-harmful by the OECD. And this is another thing that's very important that I, you know, holistically with regards to Labuan that I cannot emphasize enough, uh, which is this. I think, uh, you know, and it may not necessarily apply as much uh, to the insurance uh, subsector and vertical as the other sectors that we work in. But it's important to note that the mutual solution provides very elegant um, an elegant explanation with regards to the pull and push factors that Labuan uh, experiences, right? 
So as an international financial center, our role is really to garner as much business, be as business friendly as possible, facilitate transactions and intermediation, right? Have a light touch approach to certain uh, aspects of the business, but you know, and, and in certain aspects have, have, a tougher, have, have a tougher stance, obviously, with regards to supervision and laundering and stuff like that. But how do you how do you check and balance this, right? And the check and balance comes from the fact that you know, Labuan MBFC reports and Labuan FSA that manages Labuan MBFC reports to the Minister of Finance. And when we are assessed by global multilateral assessors, be it the OECD or FATF or APG or, you know, um, the insurance assessors, we are assessed as part of Malaysia. So the rules and the standards and the regulations that Malaysia must adhere to, Labuan adheres to too, right? And that, it, that creates a very elegant push and pull for Labuan. That creates a very well-regulated, structured, supervised, and yet at the same time, flexible and proportionate uh, regime, right? And I think this is one of the key aspects of Labuan that cannot be underemphasized, right? That we sit in a very sweet spot that we can never go all the way too far, either one end or the other, right? This, this is very important. And it, it can't be articulated very well in a slide. So, um, so that, that's one of the reasons it's not necessarily here. But, you know, I, I think it's important to remember that, okay? Uh, at the back of your mind, when you think of Labuan, always remember that balance, right? The, the dutching, as it were, the, 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 that, that weighing scale. It's legislated by a common law framework. So, you know, uh, like the rest of Malaysia, very extensive suite of legislation, right? So, and actually a lot of people say, oh, it's, it's quite new, our legislation. It's, it's now 10 years old, 11 years old, but in, this, in, in the space of financial services, it's still relatively quite new. Um, and we create very bespoke solutions. Obviously, captives is something that we're very keen to talk about. And again, you know, the captive story, as it were, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Labuan is very similar to the reinsurance vis-a-vis uh, -vis Labuan. It's organic. It came from Malaysia. So, you know, when we first started looking at the captive solution and really trying to push the captive message out there to the larger space, um, I would say 80-90% of all captives in, in Labuan were Malaysian, right? And, and that, that actually comforts a lot of people on the outside because they understand that it's already tried and tested um, domestically, right? So captives is something that, you know, keeps growing and, and we continue to push. Um, deemed as non-resident under the Malaysian foreign exchange rules. So the ECN rules that apply or domestically in Malaysia does not apply in Labuan, right? For all intents and purposes, um, it runs, uh, there are two financial systems, two banking systems, two insurance systems that run in Malaysia. One is under the Labuan cloud and one is under the domestic uh, uh, Nagara cloud. OK, currency neutrality. So you're able to transact in any currency as you wish uh, and supported by the bankers in Labuan or actually supported by any bankers globally that you have. Right. Again, it's cost effective, substance enabling with that element of tax efficiency. So at the moment, uh, all taxes in Labuan are, stand, are set at three percent. Right. Uh, for the insurance sector, it's very clear it's three percent. Of course, you have the option of paying the Malaysian tax rate of 24 percent if it, if it suits you. Um, and you have access to most of Malaysian, uh, the Malaysian DTA network. OK, uh, the substance that is required in Labuan is. Very minimal. And because we are located in Labuan and in Malaysia and uh, businesses uh, transact in Malaysian ringgit, it's extremely uh, cost efficient compared to other global centers. Right. So this is actually uh, the last slide is actually our contact details. Uh, so stay in touch. I'm happy to now uh, go into the discussion. Thank you so much, Farah, for the insightful webinar. I'm sure our audiences have a lot of questions for you and it's coming in. 
and we will be opening the Q and session, uh, Q and A session right now. So if you had, if you guys have any other questions, please do share it below as well. So the first question we have, Farah, is from Mukesh, and he has shared with us a link as well. But let me read out the question: Does the IBFC have any responsibility or accountability for those entities whose license have been revoked? See the Labuan Investor Alerts, and then he shared a link over here. I think it's um an enforcement actions taken by Labuan Financial mm. Services Authority. Yeah. Um, do we have any responsibility? Our responsibility, I guess, I mean, I'm speaking on behalf of the regulator, which really I shouldn't because I'm obviously I'm not a regulator. But from my understanding, and I, I ca so I caveat this, uh, my understanding is, is, is quite clear that first and foremost, the regulator has a duty to ensure that all their license holders are well regulated and adhere to all the laws, uh, the client protection laws with regards to uh, uh, any uh, license holders. I think there will be some kind of a negotiation with regards to uh, any outstanding dues and stuff like that. But other than that, with regards to responsibility, as it were, uh, I, 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 it, it, I would assume that the responsibility lies within the, with the license holder. Although the license holder then has a responsibility to a regulator to ensure that client uh, and part and business uh, business uh, cross business entities uh, and their how to say their their legal requirements are met on both sides. Mm -hmm. So to the regulator and to their partners or clients dash slash clients as it were. And with that said, how did it impact you guys during the COVID nineteen? Has it um, made any changes with the industry and how does this affect you and also the participants with us here today that we can take up and you know be more skillful and upskill ourselves with adapting to the environment now well actually annie maybe you could share a little bit about the uh the relief that the regulator has has allowed during COVID. but you know and 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 but before that let me just talk a little bit about you know, what's important to note is that actually as an as an international intermediation center, a lot of what we were already doing was online. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the pivot to online work um, was easy for the, relatively easy for the industry, I think, especially the insurance industry, because they're so well connected. Um, that's that's one thing. I think the regulator also stepped in to allow for a lot of relief that, you know, any any can talk about a little bit. Um, but for us at the market development arm, um, it was really very challenging because a lot of what we do uh, involved traveling, involved meeting people, developing partnerships and, yeah. and, and things like that. And it's just quite, I mean, you know, Cash, you and I, we've not met personally. Uh, you know, the, the feeling is different. I've not met Vicky personally yet. Uh, so the, the feeling is a little bit different. It takes a bit more time to, to develop partnerships. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been challenging. Uh, Annie, do you have anything else to say? Yeah, I or do. I, I I do. I was I was looking through and I saw a bit of your relief um, programs. The way uh, of what Farah said, maybe Annie, we can we can share a bit about that. Okay, I mean basically um, for those license holders, you know all the regulatory reportings that we have to submit, they will be relief exactly like what Bank Nagara did, you know. So, you know, instead of sending it every quarter, maybe they extend a little bit longer, especially in the beginning when people first started last year, March, mm -hmm. when people first started, suddenly, you know, like, okay, yeah. everybody have to start working from home. But as we go by, I think everybody now, we actually, frankly speaking, COVID tested our BCP. Definitely. Um, so, so if it works, it works. That means our BCP works, you know, something like that. So, but the relief given by the regulator was uh, is was welcome, especially in the beginning last year. This mm. year is a bit better, except for maybe you know May, May, April. All the auditors mm. cannot go to office because everybody is closed. The audit was not um, considered essential services. Mm. Yeah. So it's a bit difficult. So they did expand it including inland revenue actually now inland revenue says you no know, like you can submit your tax longer i mean later than as compared to previously so mm -hmm. both inland revenue and labon fsa has been very proactive in this and then yeah. including all the solvency margins and things yes. like that so they, they, they're looking at all these things to help out 
and uh, for example, Labon FSA say previously work permit to be issued, your salary must be ten thousand ringgit. With everybody oh. having having this problem, nobody is working and things like that. So they reduced to five thousand, which helped the employer, you know, to stay in business and things like that instead of, uh, you know. Yes. With the ten thousand ringgit every month to pay your staff. Mm -hmm. So these are the sort of things that the regulator has been doing. Uh, they've been very proactive, and for any new license application, now they, you know, we submit online, and you know, like banking. Previously, we have to stamp, do you know, get notarized, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, while waiting for that, that we submit online, the process on that basis first before it's being notarized. After, after you know, you get it, then you courier it to Labon FSA. So, yeah, um, Labon FSA has, um, what do you call that, processed so many licenses during yeah. Yeah. years. I mean, it's more than, oh, about two years already. So, almost. So, but I mean, initially, yes, it was challenging, but as we go by, Labon FSA has adapted and Labona VFC has adapted to the environment. We're doing a lot of webinars, uh, things like that. Uh, uh, Labona VFC, uh, Labona VFC has been promoting Labon. No, so it's it's it's, it's to be to be honest with you, right? And I, I, I thanks Annie for that, but you know, and thanks Haru for for your note there. Uh, I really am quite amazed to be honest with you when you look back over the 18 months right and how bad things have been it's also to, to see the growth you know to see the growth yeah. in Labuan generally um, and especially in the insurance sector where you know everyone thought that with uh, the pandemic the insurance sector was going to be really hard hit right yeah. uh, you know but the resilience has been amazing that's that's one thing to note the other thing to remember is that Labuan really really suffered from a very bad case of the delta virus um, in April Mm. So now Labon has become the poster child of the country, right? Herd immunity and all the rest of it. Yeah. Uh, but because they went through, we went through something very, very bad in April when uh, some people came in and they had the Delta. This is when Peninsula Malaysia didn't understand the Delta yet, mm -hmm. right? So they really had to hunker down. You know, my colleagues in Labon FSA, the players in Labon IBFC, the insurance managers, the, everyone had re really had to hunker down. And even during that time, and that was what, maybe three months ago, yeah. Um, business is as usual. Well, actually, business is as usual as it can be under current circumstances. Mm. So, yeah, it's it's been it's been a very uh, rewarding time, I should say. All right. Thank you so much, Annie and Farah. Um, just one more question, though. So we did have a captive webinar before this, and mm. I and I did go through um, Lab One's website, and uh, I just went through like a few case studies on how creative uses for captives in hard market and the fastest growing captive center in Asia is Lab One IBFC. So maybe we can share a little bit about that um, with our audiences here today, because um, the last captive webinar was really challenging and everyone was trying to figure out how to implement it in organizations, right? And um, with that said, maybe Farah, um, a little bit on that. Right, so the cap the captive uh, element within Labuan, as I mentioned earlier, grew organically from a lot of large Malaysian corporates, right? So mm -hmm. Labuan is still home to the only rated captive in Asia, which is the Anorgas captive, it's the Patronas captive. Um, and since then, however, I think what we have tried to do within the market development arm is to make people understand the benefits of captives. And I think as the market over the last, I don't know, four years has become harder and harder, people are starting to appreciate uh, uh, the benefits of captives. Uh, I think even, you know, and dare I say this, I think the brokers are starting to also appreciate that maybe they do have a role within the captive flow, pass through of business. Yeah. Right. And I think that's something that's important to remember that brokers onshore in Malaysia have an opportunity to really expand their business horizon when they start uh, dealing and understanding uh, captives better and understanding their role within that, that, that flow, that deal flow. Yeah. Uh, that deal flow. I think that's important to remember. So, but with everything else in life that seems to be growing, there is a coming together of different elements. It's not necessarily just one thing that makes it suddenly, you know, grow. So yeah. first we had a very strong base from the Malaysian captives. 
then the market started getting harder. At the same time, we started pushing the captive proposition within Asia because we realized, right, it's very ironic. Uh, we realized one day doing research that the world's GDP is now being driven by Asians, Asian mm. companies. Yeah. And yet when you look at the 6,000, 7,000 captives you have globally, there's a very small element of that, of Asia within that. Yes. And there's two reasons for that, right? And the first reason is, okay, the box standard reason, uh, not a lot of awareness. The second is that Malaysian, uh, Asian corporates are so large, they just set up their own reinsurance company, right? Mm -hmm. So it's either one or the other, right? Yeah. Uh, so the ones that are setting up their own reinsurance company, fine, well and good, right? But the ones that are not aware, what we wanted to do was really, you know, push better awareness. So we, we did that. So the markets got harder. We already had a strong base, remember? Uh, the markets got harder. We started pushing the concept of captives, okay? Then we had COVID. Mm -hmm. With COVID, right, the market got, you know, if the market didn't get harder, um, if it's possible to get any harder, um, if the market didn't get harder, what people started to understand is that there were lines, not necessarily just the market, but there were lines of business that they just couldn't get cover for. Yeah. Like, you know, cyber or DNO or whatever, and then comes in this idea of a cell captive. And the cell captive is a very easy turnkey captive in the sense that you can take a particular line that you need covered, go to, to a particular PCC provider. This is a commercial PPC provider and say, OK, I just want to place this line within this cell. Mm -hmm. And then you are able to then get coverage for this cell. So, you know. Really, for me personally, when I look at it from a very helicopter point of view, it really is got to do with the coming together of a lot of different elements that's made Labuan, uh, the recognition for Labuan as a captive domicile grow. And yeah. we've yeah. seen an, in, a lot of interest with regards to cells because of COVID, because it's not just about necessarily the, the whole end to end risk management uh, element, but a very dire need for a particular line uh, to get covered. Uh, Annie or, or Roy or anyone else from the LIIA or Haru who have anything else to add towards that? I would like to add a comment from um, Roy. He has stated it in a chat. So members of Midba should explore opportunities of self-risk management via captive, rent a captive or captive cells in the Lab One environment. Such prospects don't have be don't have to be large companies alone. So participants. I mean, you don't have to be a large company to own a captive or to even um, explore it as well. And I think what uh, Farah has also shared, um, reinsurance um, can also, uh, with small companies, right, Farah? They also can um, venture and explore into this. And we have... Um, we have actually, we have the two experts here. So we have Roy, who is the chairman of the Labuan International Insurance Association. And we have Harusan, who actually runs a commercial PCC uh, provider, maybe they can share a little bit more with regards to this. Yeah, yeah. I just like to add on to 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 my comment that um, for for members of Midbar, this also creates a wonderful business opportunity, not only from the front end as a direct broker, but you can play a critical role um, from a risk management point of view vis-a-vis captives, renter captives and cells. Plus, um, you can also play a significant role in reinsuring that captive on your own. You don't need to work with a loved one reinsurance broker. You can do it on your own. Uh, it's only when you are dealing with some complex risks and you require some analytics behind it, then partnering with a reinsurance broker uh, of your choice probably be helpful. But beyond that, you don't even need to do so. Um, and mid members can and take care of the trade trade kind of uh, situation and own that business opportunity um, together. So I think mid members should think about it seriously. As to yes. the difference between last point on from Iskanda, if I may cover it very quickly, a reinsurance and a captive, a reinsurance company fundamentally carries all the risk from any incident. 
a captive is very focused and it basically the word captive itself as the word would suggest that it is very focused on a particular captive based business. Yes, fundamentally they will operate no differently from an insurer from a point of carrying the risk, all the theoretical arguments that you can apply the same, the business purpose is very focused. Captives are more of risk management, financial, and tax too. Whereas a reinsurance company is not only about that, but beyond that. Basically, a reinsurance company is insuring third party risk and an in, uh, captive is insuring first party risk meaning your own risk the owner of the captive risk uh, basically that's the difference all right thank you so much Annie Roy and Farah we have another question um, coming up for the benefit of by one Muzamir for the benefit of others who are licensed here what is the limitation of broker insurance broker license in Labu one from operation jurisdiction point of view. Um, if I may answer that, uh, you're talking about limitation of broker, broker license in Love One. A life, a, a Love One broker, um, kind of long story short, a Love One broker can only do business. Yeah, cannot do direct business in, in Malaysia. Other than there are certain exceptions to the food, which Bank Nagara would stipulate. The only exception would probably be marine aviation and um, transport or trans transport, right? MAT. And that itself is also so limited and so controlled. So a loved one registered broker, typically from a Malaysian context, uh, cannot do any direct business. Um, and they are supposed to act as a reinsurance broker. If you mm -hmm. find any loved one broker acting as a direct insurer without Bank Nagara's approval, please let me know. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Roy. Um, there's one from Ahmed. Captive structure, including cell allows sourcing of reinsurance security of complex risks into the international and rated market, and as Roy says, for these cases, the insured does not have to be large corporations. Um, okay, I think that was just a statement. Yeah. All right. And my final question for um, people of Labuan, um, what's the future of Labuan? What can we expect from um, Labuan, Farah, and Roy, and Annie? Roy, do you want to go first? Well, As the okay. chairman of the Labuan International Insurance Association? Um, yeah, sure, sure. I think, I think Labuan as an international community um, has a lot of opportunity. And as Farah alluded, um, a lot of our business is beyond Malaysia. Though Malaysia is a critical part of our business, we do not deny that. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we look for business opportunity in Malaysia. There's no doubt about it. But uh, we are realizing that um, Love One um, has other opportunities beyond the shores of uh, Malaysia. And we are constantly looking at the new business models. One of them that we are exploring very seriously now is this concept of delegated underwriting authority, uh, mm. where we have uh, some laws that allow it, but we are in discussion with the regulator to try and, and broaden the scope uh, of delegated underwriting authority. So watch this space. Uh, we are going to develop that in the next year. Uh, but captive is very important for us, and we see that the captive business is going to grow in Lab One even more. So that too is equally important. That's yeah. my say. Yeah, and uh, do do you have any um, webinars on this that we can also share with our participants? Maybe they would be interested to be sure. you know joining in. Sure. Yeah, yeah, where where where. Wherever we we do have this kind of developmental uh, subject matters, 
uh, yes, we will let your members uh, know. And we've had had programs, technical programs and so forth, where from time to time we have invited members from Midbar, Piam and Liam as well. All right. And in that note, thank you so much, um, Farah, for your presentation and Roy and Annie as well joining us for our Q&A.